Welcome to the Susan Brinder Show. It's all about you. Featuring shows on health and wellness, the performing arts, politics, and people who inspire you to be your best. And now, here's Susan Brinder. I'm Susan Brinder, and this is the Susan Brinder Show. You know, Julie Budd is a major star, and she's been very fortunate, she says, when she was just 16 years old to be personally involved by Frank Sinatra, and she appeared with him at Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas. This was, and always will remain, a grand highlight in my life and career. As I recorded these songs, she said, it took me back to those wonderful evenings on stage and a time that I'll never forget. And that's my guest today, Julie Budd, who wrote and absolutely put together a CD called Remembering Mr. Sinatra. Welcome, Julie, to the Susan Brender Show. Thank you. It's great to speak to you again. It's been a little while. Yeah, you know, it has. And I'll tell you something. I missed you. I, I, you know, there, oh, thank I, you. you. You are just the greatest, Julie. And, you know, when I tell people that, I say it sincerely. Now, Julie Bud, you're considered to be one of the most exciting singers in music today. Um, wh- why is that? Well, that's very nice of you to say thank you so much. Um, you know, uh, when when you're involved with music like this, you know on this on this level, it's it's such a deep commitment, and <clears throat> more than being number one or number two or whatever people say that you are, it's such a deep part of your life that the commitment is so tremendous. It's it supersedes any kind of an award that you can get. Or, or any kind of accolade that you can receive. It's, it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a deep part of your life. And so when you're involved with something like that, you're not so much concerned with, you know, how famous or not famous you are. You're just always concerned with bringing the audience the best of yourself. What can I do to every day be better? What can I do every day to bring the best show I could possibly bring to people or the best CD that years after I'm gone, you know, people will still listen to this work and say, this was good work. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what makes a person great is the depth of their commitment. You know, Julie, you've appeared on some of the most renowned stages in the world alongside some of the most famous names in show business <laughs> history. I, I'm, yeah. I, it's, it's, it's remarkable that you've had a career that has spanned a long time and you're still doing it. And what did it feel like to be among those really great artists? Well, you know, at first when you hear you're going to appear with somebody like that, your your feet are like off the ground. <laughs> you know, you can't believe that somebody chose you, you know. But then you get down to um, the nuts and bolts of what you've really got to do. I'll give you an example of what I mean. Okay. When I got that phone call from Caesar's Palace via Mr. Sinatra's office, via Dave Victorson's office, who was the the head of all entertainment there at the time, wonderful man, God bless him. When I got that phone call, my my conductor and and manager at the time, Herb Bernstein, we got that phone call. We thought we were in space. <laughs> it was the greatest phone call we ever could even imagine getting. Oh, Mr. Sinatra, you know, personally picked you to come to Caesar's Palace with him and, and appear with him. I was 16 years old. I mean, you know, you just thought, you know, the angels kissed you on the forehead, you know, and they probably did. Yeah. But the thing is, then then another thing happens. Like two seconds later, after you finish jumping up and down and carrying on and screaming and yelling, you can't believe it, then you get down to brass tacks. Then you get down to, um, you know, I have to hold my own when I get up there. I have to... I have to I have to show up, you know. I I really have to, this has to be the greatest thing that I've done. This has to be. You don't rest on the fact that oh, you know, I'm 16 years old and, you know, they're going to think I'm cute. You're going to have to um you're going to have to hold your own with full-fledged adults 
who've been doing this for 40 years. You're going to have to be as good as any adult that walks into that room. When you, when you start out as early as I did, um, two things happen to you. You either, you either look at this like it's a serious business or you get all carried away with that stuff and then you last about 10 minutes. Do you know what I mean, Susan? Yeah, yeah I do. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting, uh, Julie, because as I listen to you talk about singing when you were 16 years old, I, I think about the young people today. And I want, mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I have to just ask you this question. Uh, do, do they appreciate uh, the music that you do? Yes, they do. Yes, they, they appreciate it tremendously. And I go to universities and, you know, I teach master classes every now and then. And I love doing it because what it does for me is, you know, Susan, when you teach, you become a better student yourself. It's a, it's a very interesting thing about teaching, but you and I can chat about that another time. But that is something that does happen when you, when you teach. And you also become very, very um, <clears throat> in tune with who is really out there listening and, and you know, demographically too. Young kids today are not really given enough credit. They are a lot more interested and a lot more in tune than you really would think they are. And what's wrong with television and radio today is they don't trust that theory. So therefore, the programmers, the people that are in charge of, you know, all this programming and doing all their demographics and all their marketing and testing, sometimes, not all the time, because sometimes they're very good at it, but sometimes they really miss the mark because sometimes they are so busy worrying about, you know, the demographics of things that they don't realize that, you know, young people are curious. Young people want to know what came before them. Young people want to know how it got here, how it became like that. And young people, this is what I find when I teach, are dying to know how you did it. They're dying to know, you know, what they can do to do what you did and even more. Well, tell tell them, Julie, before you continue, tell them how did you do it? Well, you know, it took a lot of chutzpah. It took a lot of, a lot of stuff. Um, And it took a lot of, it took, it took a lot to take a leap of faith in myself. You know, it's funny, when you want to do something, you always want somebody to believe in you. But, you know, before you step out the door in the morning, you better believe in yourself because, you know, there are a lot of good and talented people out there trying to do the same thing you're doing. And um, when I was 12 years old, um, (laughs) it was a weird thing. I didn't want to go to sleepwear camp anymore. (laughs) I was not a camper. My sisters, I have two sisters, and they are adorable, and um, Susan and Jill, my sisters, and... They went to sleepaway camp with me, and they were like, camper of the day, camper of the minute, camper of the moment. I'm laying on the bed dying. When am I getting out of here? It's itchy. You know, I'm a, you know I was not a camper. You know, oh, yeah, I got to go on a cold lake. I just saw a salamander. Help, God. Make it. it was like Camp Granada. You ever, you ever hear the story? Yes. The song, Hello, Mother, Hello, Father. Here I am in Camp Granada. Remember that? Yes, I do indeed. Mike's on the nut. Alan Shepard. It's, it's classic. Fabulous. Okay, that was me. That was me. That was me. <laughs> so my parents, so my parents said, my parents said, okay, okay, next summer, next summer, we're not going to torture you. You don't have to go to sleepaway camp. We're going to go upstate New York to the Catskills, and and <laughs> I'm going to get mommy a beautiful room in the hotel, and you kids will be in the connecting room next door. P.S. What does my mother do? She puts me in day camp the minute I get up there. But it wasn't terrible. <laughs> it wasn't terrible because I didn't have to go to sleepwear camp. Okay. So one day I find out. I don't, I don't even remember how I found out. But I found out. Oh, you know who I found out? My cousin told me. My cousin Susie was up there with me. God, I just remember that. It was my cousin Susie told me that there was a talent show because she was up there with me. And... I cut camp, of course, because you know me, I'm a lover of camp, and I went, I know it's crazy, I went down to the showroom, 
And remember, up in the Catskills, they had these huge showrooms, 1,500 seats, 2,000 seats, huge, huge, mm -hmm. like the Concord. Remember the Concord oh, was 3,500 seats. Oh, can't forget it. Remember the Concord? Oh, it's right. And Grossinger. Well, well big room. Julie, 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 tell the audience, because, you know, not everybody knows about the Borscht Belt or the Concord oh, Hotel. Oh, yeah, the Catskills was fun, wasn't it? Oh, my God. I grew up in the Catskills, so I understand. But you know what, Julie? A lot of people don't. So it, explain to them what that time was Well, if like. they ever saw Dirty Dancing, if they ever saw Dirty Dancing, the movie Dirty Dancing, it really is pretty much a depiction. Well, that was kind of a smaller hotel, but it was, it was a depiction of what the life up in the Catskills in the summertime. And, you know, you'd go Saturday night to these gorgeous showrooms, and Alan King would be there one week, and Lena Horne would be there the next week, and... Uh, I remember the Concord had Judy Garland there one time. I mean, they had major, major names. Uh, I remember the Browns Hotel was where Jerry Lewis used to always work. Remember the Browns? Uh, absolutely. Jerry Lewis, that was his hotel. So there I was. I went to the showroom with all of these very famous people on a Saturday night, you know, used to entertain. And here I am, this little pisher of 12 years old. I looked like I was eight. I was skinny. I was short. I was little. I, I looked like a peanut, you know. Mm -hmm. And I walked into this place, and uh, this gentleman greets me, you know, as an ex-prize fighter, tough-looking guy, sweetheart. I owe, I owe my entire career to him. His name was Vic Minow. Mm -hmm. And uh, Vic said to me, what are you doing here? You should be in camp. And I went, no, 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 I, I don't go to camp. <laughs> <laughs> he said, what are you doing here? I said, I'm here to be in the talent show. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, another kid that sings at bar mitzvahs. All right, what do you want to sing? Now, at the, at the piano, there was a gentleman who was a very fine musician, very famous. His name was Milton Lear, a wonderful musician and a real gentleman. So he says, what do you want to sing, sweetie? So I said, um, I'll sing Moon River and Who Can They Turn To? Well, they couldn't believe that like an 11 or 12-year-old kid would even choose that, you know, Moon River or Who Can I Turn To? It's, it's a sophisticated choice musically mm -hmm. for a child, you know. And then they go and they ask me what key I'm going to do it in. So now I knew I was really cooked. So I said, just follow me. And they thought that was hilarious. Well, P.S., I, I wound up being in the show that night. I won the show, and a gentleman by the name of Herb Bernstein was there. Mm -hmm. Herb Bernstein, turns out, was up there with his family. He was recording Laura Nero at the time, John Denver, The Four Seasons, The Happenings, Lainey Kazan, mm -hmm. Tina Turner. I could go on and on. He sold 40 million records, Herb mm -hmm. Bernstein. Oh, boy. He, his, his recordings that he did with Laura Nero are actually in the, the Grammy Hall of Fame. Well, let me stop and, you for just a moment. And, and he recorded me. Yeah, he recorded me. He, he did. And, and you know, I just interviewed somebody by the name of Helena Lynn. <clears throat> Does that ring a bell? No. Well, Helena was played with Laura Nero and... Um, oh, and maybe Herbie knows her. Oh, I bet he does. And absolutely, um, there is such a, uh, oh, I don't know, when I listen to you, uh, I, I hear Helena Lynn. I mean, all of <laughs> all of you were just absolutely part of that fabulous generation where there was music that you could understand the words and uh, people danced to. Today, I don't think everybody appreciates I don't know, that. Susan. I think there are a lot, I think there are a lot of really, really gifted kids out there now. I think the problem is, is that a lot of people do right now what a lot of young people do uh, when they record, and that is they chase the market because everybody wants that hit record. Mm -hmm. So they start you know, doing what they think, you know, the producers and and the people want to want to sell and what the record companies may want. First of all, there are no record companies anymore. But anyway, but 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 I go around the country. I got to tell you, there's a lot of talent out there, and there are a lot of kids that even before they become famous, uh, do a lot of musical theater. Mm -hmm. And train incredibly. You know, it's funny. It's funny. I just saw on YouTube, and this is very apropos to what we're talking about. I just saw on YouTube from 1986 or 1989, something like that, like a bazillion years ago, um, a film clip, uh, uh, an excerpt of the show that uh, that was done on the Oscars. 
and they called it the new generation of kids coming to Hollywood. And it was all these unknowns, all these unknowns. Who were they at the time? Um, Patrick Dempsey, um, you know, all these kids mm-hmm. that were like on TV now and became big stars. Yeah. I got to tell you, when I saw him dance, I could not believe it. Mm-hmm. I said to myself, he should be on Broadway. What is he doing? This singing, dancing, like a leading man on Broadway. And then it came to me. I said, you know, nobody just arrives in Hollywood or New York. Everybody gets their training somewhere, whether it's, you know, in college at musical theater or going on the road at Summerstock or training in their area with great dance teachers or singing teachers, whatever they do. There is so much talent out there. You cannot believe it. I think a big problem is, is that people think that they have to do certain things in order to sort of get over in a commercial world. And what happens is you don't really see the talent that they have. You don't see it. Mm -hmm. Jolie Fisher was singing and dancing. Corey Feldman was singing and dancing. God, there were so many. Uh, Ricky Lake. Mm -hmm. Ricky Lake was singing like you can't believe. Singing like unbelievable. And I said to myself, Listen, I heard Queen Latifah do, uh, was it Body and Soul, or one of those wonderful pieces? Well, if you see her her movie, Bessie, you'll see how fantastically she sings. They don't always get that opportunity, Susan. And and it's a shame, because they do possess it. They really do. And they're Mm well-trained. So, so Julie, um, what does it... does it require to actually um, be a good singer and someone who can get on stage? I, there must be something in your sort of personality or in your background. Well, that's true. You're right, Susan. There is. First of all, you have to be lucky to be born with an innate instrument. You know, a lot of people think if they study and they practice and they learn how to entertain, because some people are natural performers. And then, of course, what's the thing that makes you great? Repetition. You know, they keep doing it, and they learn how to do it, and they become better at it. But the people that you're really talking about, the re- I think what I'm hearing is what makes you a really fine musician. Is That's that right. what you're saying? I am indeed. There are a couple of things that make you a fine musician. There's that great point between the black and white that you can't teach, okay? There is, there is a part of greatness that is... You know, the Almighty kissed you on your head when you were born. You you came into this world with it. You know, you have it. Judy Garland had it. Tony Bennett's got it. You know, there are people that have it. It's, you know, I call it the mazel factor. You know, they just have it. You know, they, they were born with it, and that's just the way it goes. But this is an important thing to hear. That's not enough. Because the rigors of this industry can kill a natural instrument. I'll say that again. The rigors of this industry can kill a natural instrument. And what I mean by that is if you don't, if you don't become a master at your craft, if you don't learn how to technically sing, if you don't learn how to take care of your instrument, if you don't study, you will be out of the tour more than you're in the tour because it is so tough to be out there physically on your body. Forget about emotionally. It is so tough to be out there physically that you better know how to take care of your instrument. You better study because you're going to be up against the best, especially if you get a break. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. And, and you don't want to waste a wish. So if anybody's listening within the sound of my voice who's interested in being out there as a performer, you better get some great training. Because you're going to need it. The greatest voices in the world have always said that they owe so much to their teachers. And that's because that's the stuff that keeps you alive once you make it. Yeah. Once you make it. Well, Julie, you know, you mentioned Tony Bennett, and it's interesting that you did so because I was thinking about Tony Bennett myself, and I, and Tony Bennett's no youngster. He's certainly an octogenarian. And look at him playing mm-hmm. with Lady Gaga. And um, right. and and look at the success they're having together. Isn't that amazing? That uh, yeah, but that's also that also speaks to the mazel factor, the luck, because he's lucky that he's a strong man for his age. You know, mm-hmm. he's lucky that his instrument can still respond to performance. You know, he's eighty-seven, eighty-eight years old. Mm-hmm. 
you know, he's lucky he happens to be a physically strong man because it's not just, you know, that area between your chin and your shoulder that counts, you know, your throat, but it's your whole body. You, know, you don't just sing with your throat. You sing with your whole body, you know, and that's what people don't understand. Yeah, it's true, and you're talking about your voice being an instrument. It's it's very hard. Sometimes instruments get old, you know, and when they get old, you well, know that's what, what I mean. That. That's what I mean. Yeah, 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 that's what I mean. That's exactly what I mean. So, you know, he's very, very fortunate in the fact that he probably had terrific technique. He probably had <clears throat> great method. He had a great innate instrument. And I heard Tony Bennett's recordings when he was a young kid. I mean, really young, before he was even famous. And he had incredible dexterity. He had great tone. He had great range. He had all that stuff that we talk about, you know, when you kissed on the forehead and you come into the world. And, you know, he had it all. But, you know, he also was wise enough to realize that along the way, he was going to have to learn a lot, as we all do. And so he went and he studied with the greatest people that you could study with and he you know the thing is you know I sing every day Susan even when I'm not working I sing every single day you know even if it's just for a short period of time I take myself in my office I close the door you know you drop all the vanity and you get down to to fundamentals you know and and you do the work that it takes it's that tedious boring work that it takes to to maintain a proper instrument. And, uh, you know, it's no different than an athlete that goes to the gym every day. It's no different than a ballet dancer that even when she's not in performance, she goes to class. Right. You know, I mean, this is what it is to, you know, you're an athlete. You know, when you are, when your body is the instrument, you're an athlete. Hmm. You have to be careful you don't gain too much weight. You you know, you've got to get rest. You've got to be careful what you eat because you, it, it, it affects your voice. I mean, singing is tough. Yeah, yeah, it sure is. It's, it's, it's like a big exercise, as you, as you said. Now, let me just tell you something interesting. I attended a conference that was about music in the brain. And one mm-hmm. of the things that I learned is that uh, music can have a huge impact on the way somebody feels. And you talked about sort of mentally um, whether or not uh, it, you have to kind of rehearse and get yourself feeling really in good shape. But it also has, yeah. a, it has a kind of impact on people with diseases such as Alzheimer's and and also um, I uh, I'll tell a story that I've told before. But I once went when I went to Lincoln Center to a music conference. I absolutely heard a guy who had Tourette syndrome, and every time he hit a key on his piano and sang a little verse, no more tick. So well, you know what they say because there's an area in the brain uh, uh, that controls mass. And music. Did you know that math and music are very connected? And tell her what it's Well, if there's, uh, well, I'm not an expert at uh, at the brain, but I can tell you, and I'm sure people have heard it before, uh, that uh, neurologists will tell you that the the area which stimulates the understanding of music, the appreciation of music, is in the same exact area that puts together the comprehension of mathematics. So it, it, so it, it, as per his uh, Tourette syndrome, his Tourette syndrome may be, you know, dominated by a different part of his brain than the part of his brain that maybe understands and is stronger uh, with music, you know. You've had some really interesting experiences singing, Julie, and I know that uh, one of the things about singing is that it has such an impact on people. So, so Julie, you've had some amazing experiences. You said that you like quiet in the background. And tell us the story about what happened during the time that you were sitting in your backstage room. Well, you know, um, so apropos to what you were saying about music and the brain and, you know, what can do for people. Uh, You know, I was in my dressing room, and a a woman knocks on my door maybe two hours before showtime. And, you know, that's kind of a critical time for performers. They don't usually like to be disturbed at that time because that's that's when you're doing your most important work, you know. And um, she knocked on my door, and I opened it up, 
and she did not look well. She had um, sort of a shaved scalp, and she was a little puffy and, you know, but very sweet, you know, stately-looking woman. And she said to me, she said, um, oh, I'm so happy to be here. She said she had been going through the worst cancer treatments, worst cancer treatments, and that this was going to be her night where she gets two hours, where she just doesn't have to think about her chemotherapy for a while, where, you know, she can close her eyes and just transport herself into a peaceful and happy and have her life the way she used to. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? She said, oh, I used to go out. She says, I've been sick for such a long time, and I, I just forgot what it felt like to put on a pair of heels and just go out and enjoy. And, you know, I didn't know what to do for her. I gave her a CD and photos and whatever I had in the room, a pound cake, <laughs> you know, everything you could. I just, you know, I, I felt so moved by her. And when I closed the door and I wished her well, I thought to myself, you know, you really can't be uh, so self-indulgent and a brat about these things. That what I do is really kind of a mission. It's, it, it, it soothes people. It, it, it brings people joy. It's an important job. It transports people. Music is an important thing. It, it brings nations together, if you think about it. Um, the arts are very, very important. And when you forget that and you start acting like a brat, it's a bad thing. You know, and, uh, you know, when I thought about that that night, I thought, stop being such a brat. Look at this poor woman. You have a job to do. Shut up and make people happy. Mm-hmm. You know, you're so fortunate that you could do this. When I went out on stage that night, um, you know, I dedicated a song to her and, you know, all that stuff. But it was the first time I really got a sense of like what you just said about music and the mind and how it's important in people's souls and bodies and that if you have the opportunity to be the person who provides that that's a very nice mission in life yes you know julie um you talked to me uh about many things that happened in your life on our last show um but now i'd like to know where are you now what's what's going on with julie bud tell tell our audience more about that well, right now I'm really concentrating tremendously on my recording, Julie Budd Remembering Mr. Sinatra. It's a very personal CD to me because it is a retrospect and a little bit of a valentine to those times that I spent with Mr. Sinatra at Caesars Palace in concert when he was so kind uh, to invite me on his show. And it was a very, very pivotal time in my life. And... um This CD, it's interesting, you know, I didn't even think of it as being his 100th anniversary, and and here it is coming out on his centennial. And it's it's my personal thank you and tribute uh, to those songs that really were the backbone of American, the finest American music that was ever written. And people are still performing these pieces today. And he asked me, he asked me to continue to do these songs. So um, that's what I'm really concentrating on right now. Last time I spoke to you, I was talking to you about my book. I'm almost finished with the book, Susan. Oh, we have to have I'm you almost on the show finished. again then to talk about your book. Yeah. Next yeah. year at this time, I bet you it'll be out. I'm, I'm almost finished with the book. You know, it's been so hard for me to finish because, you know, I get so caught up in other projects that it pulls me away from writing. But um, I have a feeling in the next six to eight months I'm going to be finished. So next time I see you, um, I'd love to talk to you about my book. So I've been concentrating on my recordings, concentrating on the book, and we're going to be bringing Remembering Mr. Sinatra not only to the Metropolitan Room here in New York and at Barnes & Noble as well. You know, they're doing a big presentation on the 28th with me, and September 10th I'll be uh, at Barnes & Noble. But also I'm finishing up my residency in October and December at the Met Room, and then I'm going to the Berry Center to on Mr. Sinatra's birthday at Ramapo College, the Berry Center, to perform uh, Remembering Mr. Sinatra. But then I'm going to bring it to Vegas oh. because that's where I met Mr. Sinatra. And where are you going to be doing that? At the Smith Center for the Performing Arts. Well, you are a very busy lady, Julie Bud. 
Well, it keeps you out of trouble, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Julie, I can't wait to uh, hear more about your book, and um, I look forward to having you back on the Susan Brender Show. It's just been such a very interesting show, and thank you, Julie, for being with me. Oh, Susan, you're such a doll. I'm sending you a hug. You're always the most supportive, sweetest person, and I hope I'll see you at the shows or or presentations. I owe you a hug in person. I, I feel the same way. So we've been listening to Julie Budd and all her stories and what she's doing now, and what she is doing now is remembering Mr. Sinatra. And let's go out on hearing a little bit of a song. Susan Brender Show. 